invasion, which I'm sure you know is what precipitated our involvement in the Second World War. Uh, prior to that, they had some success in breaking the German ciphers, and they'd started to build a mechanical machine to help them do that. And here is a sketch of the machine uh, that the Poles built, and they called their machine Bomber. Why did they call it Bomber? Well, there are several possible explanations, one of which here involves an ice cream, and you can read that on the first board inside the door there. Personally, uh, I don't think that's a very likely explanation. In my opinion, more likely is that in the Polish language, uh, the word bomber, have we got any Polish speakers here? No, the word bomber is an exclamation of delight. Hooray, I've got it, I've found it, not half bad. Uh, a bit like Eureka uh, in, in Greek. And uh, in fact, uh, one uh, Polish gentleman who was visiting one day uh, did say actually uh, you could apply the word bomber to an attractive lady if you thought she was a bit of a, uh, a cracker. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, they called their machine uh, bomber, and prior to their uh, invasion, uh, they invited us Brits out and they told us all that they found out about breaking uh, the German uh, ciphers. Uh, they gave us the, uh, the plans for their uh, bomber machine. Uh, they even actually gave us an Enigma machine. Uh, not a German one, uh, but a Polish clone. Uh, the Polish intelligence had managed to work out the latest uh, features of the German Enigma machine, and so the Poles uh, were able to give us that. And then uh, they destroyed everything, uh, so that when the Germans invaded Poland, uh, they wouldn't uh, realize how long the route of breaking the ciphers uh, the Poles had, had got. Well, if you've seen the film The Imitation Game, uh, they don't call uh, the machine uh, bomb or, or, or bomb, but I should just perhaps uh, mention uh, that uh, uh, when we continue to um, enlarge and develop their bomber machine, in deference to the Poles, uh, we called it the bomb machine, uh, B-O-M-B-E. Uh, there's an E on the end of the word uh, because there was a French connection in there somewhere, uh, which I haven't really got time to go into. Uh, now, uh, but as, a, as I was about to say, if you watch the film The Imitation Game, they don't call it the bomb, bomb or bomber. What do they call it in The Imitation Game? They call it Christopher. You're absolutely right. Because Christopher Morkham uh, was Alan Turing's friend at Sherborne School, and the film director obviously wanted to emphasize that sort of part of the story. So in the film, it was called Christopher. But no, no, it was never Christopher. It was the, the bomb machine in, in wartime. And in that film, too, it rather suggested that Turing himself built the prototype. But no, he didn't. Uh, genius though he was, like a lot of talented academics, he perhaps didn't know one end of a screwdriver uh, from the other. And so his theoretical design was passed to the uh, British Tabulation Machine Company in Letchworth, Hertfordshire, about 40 miles uh, from here, and it was their chief engineer, Harold Keane, Doc Keane, who interpreted Turing's theoretical design and came up with the sort of hardware uh, that you see behind me. Well, come the end of the war, uh, there were over 200 of these bomb machines uh, in the UK, uh, only six of them here at Bletchley Park, mainly for training and development. And then, uh, come the end of the war, uh, most of them uh, were demolished. Why was that? Uh, several uh, possible uh, reasons. This isn't a universal uh, machine, like a universal computer. Uh, it's de designed for one job only. And once that was no longer needed, then neither was the machine. And in austere post-war uh, Britain, a lot of the components in the back, the relays and things, could profitably be recycled in other uh, applications. Uh, so that's, that's one reason. Another is that at the end of the war, the Russians were supposedly our allies. Uh, though some of us thought it rather an uncozy alliance and could foresee the Cold War coming. And it's uh, probable that during the Cold War, uh, the Russians used this sort of technology uh, to encipher their messages. And had we made it known publicly that we could easily, quickly, mechanically break those sort of ciphers, uh, then uh, the Russians would have used something else. And by uh, dismantling them, we hoped to keep that a secret. And I think we uh, achieved fairly well because we were able to read Russian ciphers uh, through, the, through the Cold War. We're told that the two of these machines uh, did finally make their way down to GCHQ in Cheltenham. Uh, that's today's equivalent of Bletchley Park. Uh, we're told that they were broken up in the 60s. Uh, whether you believe that, 
whether you believe anything you hear about GCHQ uh, is another matter. Uh, but that's likely, by the 60s, this sort of technology was, was old hat. So, but what you see behind me here is not an original uh, wartime uh, bomb machine. None exist. Uh, it's a reconstruction. It was the dream of some engineers who worked here at the park uh, to do this. How on earth did they manage it? Well, at GCHQ were quite helpful. Uh, they've got some blueprints of the wartime bombs, uh, not in very good condition, not a complete set, uh, mainly component diagrams rather than wiring diagrams. Uh, but some clever guys with some uh, CAD technology did in fact manage to, to work out the, the circuitry of, of the bomb machine. Uh, but all the um, tooling that had been produced to, to make the specialised parts during the war, all that had long since disappeared. And in those two cabinets there, you can see some of the jigs uh, that had to be produced uh, to make those uh, specialised parts uh, for the rebuild. Uh, the first bomb machine in wartime from commissioning, uh, conception to commissioning, took just over 12 months. Uh, this rebuild took just over 12 years. Um, but there wasn't the pressure of wartime uh, behind these guys. Um, there, there were volunteers working in their spare time, and many of them in workshops at the bottom of their gardens. Uh, the original man shed concept. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, they did uh, uh, produce uh, what you see behind me. Uh, if you see a, a picture of a wartime bomb, it will have a name plaque on, on the top. Uh, there are a couple in the cabinet. Uh, cabinet there, Washington and Houston, uh, you will never uh, see a, um, a wartime one with the name Phoenix, uh, but it was thought particularly appropriate to name uh, this rebuild Phoenix because it had risen from the ashes, uh, so to speak. So what was the uh, bomb machine uh, uh, all about? It was to try and help uh, uh, break the ciphers that were produced by the German Enigma machines. And uh, uh, the most basic uh, three-rotor machine here, uh, very similar to the one that you see uh, in the cabinet uh, over there. Uh, the three-rotor machine, as used by the Wehrmacht and the Luftwaffe, uh, the German Army and the German uh, uh, Air Force. Well, um, there were only ordinary German squaddies who, who used them, these machines, not uh, talented mathematicians or scientists, uh, so they had to be quite easy to use. Uh, so quite simply, if the operator pressed, say, P on the uh, keyboard, uh, a different lamp would light up on the lamp board, uh, say Q, and so that would mean that P uh, was enciphered as Q. Uh, but the clever thing about it is, if you press P a second time, you are highly unlikely to get Q a second time, uh, because every time you press a key on the keyboard, uh, this right-hand rotor moves on one position and changes the uh, wiring uh, configuration. So without getting too technical, uh, just to concentrate particularly on the uh, three uh, rotors inside the uh, machine, if I were to input N into this uh, right-hand rotor, the cross-wiring uh, might change it uh, to uh, Z, uh, to X, to B, it gets reflected, change, change, and comes out as Y. N would be enciphered as Y. Uh, but I hope you can appreciate that if you input N, you would get Y. If you input Y, you get N. The machine is reciprocal, which is great if you're sending uh, messages. The German types in his original uh, plain text message in German. Uh, out comes the ciphertext. It's sent by Morse code to another German, if, if he has an identical Enigma machine set up to an identical configuration, if then he types in the ciphertext, because of the reciprocality, out comes the original uh, plain text. Absolutely great. Uh, there is one slight downside uh, to it, and I don't think you need to be an electronics engineer uh, to appreciate uh, this. If I input N, yes, it gets changed, 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 uh, but the reflect because of the reflector, it's impossible uh, for the wiring to bring it back to N. Uh, not because the machine is malfunctioning, it just, just cannot happen uh, because the, re uh, the reflector is going to uh, do a transposition uh, there. And so back to my um, original uh, explanation. If I press P, I can get any lamp lighting up on the lamp board there apart from P. It cannot uh, self encipher. Uh, the Germans were aware of that, but they decided to run with it for ease of operation 
using the same machine and the same settings for, uh, for sending and receiving. And we Brits knew all about it uh, uh, too. Uh, and in fact, it is that particular feature uh, of the Enigma that it cannot self encipher that the bomb machine exploits, uh, as you will uh, hear uh, in a moment or two. Well, uh, just uh, concentrating a little bit more on the Enigma. Uh, machine. Uh, what perhaps you do not realize is that the basic design of the Enigma machine was not secret. It was not developed for the German military. Uh, the first patent was taken out in 1919. It was designed for banks and financial business houses to communicate securely one with another. It was on the open uh, market. We Brits purchased a couple of them, uh, didn't think much to them, uh, put them in our, our archives, uh, but actually they came in quite useful when we came to design our own enciphering machine, uh, the Type X machine, uh, an example of which uh, you can see uh, in, in the corner uh, there. And we ensured uh, that our Type X machine could uh, self encipher. Uh, so that glitch with the Enigma machine was uh, ironed out. Well, there's another uh, film, uh, not the imitation game. Uh, I don't think I mentioned the name. It, it suggests that it was the American capture uh, of uh, <laughs> an Enigma machine uh, that was the big deal that helped us sit immensely. Uh, but no, uh, even though there's uh, this truth behind that film, uh, no, no, not really. Um, once we got one Enigma machine and its associated uh, rotors, and as I said, the Poles did give us this, this clone. Once we got one, to capture more and more of the same type of Enigma machine really was no big deal. Um, okay, the Germans brought out different variants, and in a cabinet up the gallery there, you can see some of those variants. And the four rotor machine in particular, which the German Navy used with their U boats and blacked us out of the Atlantic for about nine months. Uh, capture one of those, uh, yes, important. But again, capture more and more of the same type of machine was really no big deal. The big deal to capture was uh, this. And this was the key sheet uh, that told you how to set up the Enigma uh, machine. So this details settings for one month, and you can see the days of the month uh, uh, 1 to 31 uh, down the side there. Uh, the basic Enigma machine uh, can only hold three rotors, uh, but you can uh, take those uh, rotors out, uh, you can uh, rearrange them. Uh, there were five to choose from, uh, 5P3, that is uh, 60 possible uh, permutations. And so it's telling me on uh, day one here to put rotor uh, four in the left-hand position, uh, rotor one in the middle position, and rotor five in the right-hand position. And then around each rotor there is a... Uh, a ring with the letters of the alphabet. Uh, sorry if this gets complicated. Uh, some Enigma machines had uh, letters around them, and that one does there. Some had numbers, uh, but there was no mistake about that. A is one, B is two, and so on. Uh, so it's telling me uh, to set the ring setting of, of the left-hand rotor to 20, uh, the middle one to five, five, the, the fifth letter E, pretty obviously of the English uh, of the language of the alphabet, and um, uh, 10 for the right-hand rotor. And then there's this plug board on the front of the Enigma uh, machine. This is something uh, that the German uh, military added. It wasn't in the original uh, commercial machine, and it did up, up the odds, uh, the complexity, uh, immensely. But rather like a, a child's puzzle, if you trace the wire that comes out of Q, it does in fact go round to R. Uh, Q is plugged to R. Here, it's telling me on day one to plug S to X. And there are nine other plug pairings to make, too. Well, without going into the uh, mathematics of it, if you put all those factors together, it makes that there are about 159 million, million, million ways of setting up the Enigma machine. Uh, more, we think, than the number of seconds that have elapsed since the Big Bang, uh, the start of the universe. Uh, so uh, no wonder the Germans were convinced uh, that the machine was, was uncrackable. Well, as you go around the park today, uh, you may hear, you may read in other areas, that as well as the very talented scientists and mathematicians, it was often human error, human frailty, human predictability uh, that helped us break into these ciphers. And so if I can just concentrate on that aspect uh, for uh, a moment. Uh, I've already uh, said that you cho choose three out of the five 
uh, rotaries. And here, these drums on the uh, Bond machine uh, replicate the cross wiring inside uh, those uh, rotaries. And they, they were color coded like this during the war. This is rotor one, two, three, four, five, all with different cross wirings uh, to each other. Uh, but all of the yellow ones having the same uh, cross wiring, uh, for instance. And I've chosen three out of the five uh, to put on this centre bank, uh, just like it would be in an in Enigma machine. I could choose a different three to put on the top bank and a different three to put on the bottom bank. Uh, so I could check uh, 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 three out of those 60 possible permutations all at once. Uh, to check all 60, I would either have to have 20 machines on the go or run the machine 20 times. But actually, at one stage uh, during the war, anyway, the Germans were quite helpful uh, because they dictated that never in a month would you have the same rotor order twice. More than that, you would never have the same rotor in the same position on two consecutive days. So I think you can appreciate then, as after the month went on, uh, things got easier, and we were very helpful, uh, very pleased for, for, for that help. Uh, sticking in that uh, vein just a little uh, longer, at the beginning of the war, uh, certainly uh, we couldn't break the ciphers. We could listen in uh, to um, this cipher sent by Morse code, uh, mean, seemingly uh, meaningless uh, jumble of letters, uh, but we paid particular attention to what we call traffic analysis. Uh, we could identify the call sign, uh, the frequency it was being sent on, the time of the day, the number of characters in the message. And by triangulation, we could get a fix from where the message was being transmitted. And we found messages being transmitted from the North Sea. No problem about that. Uh, that's going to be uh, a ship. But we found these messages coming every day. Uh, same time, same call sign, same frequency, about the same length of uh, message. And when we got a fix, uh, this ship didn't seem to have moved. Uh, so what on earth could this possibly be? It could be a static weather ship. And the Germans did have static weather ships stationed uh, in the North Sea and elsewhere. So what more likely for such a weather uh, ship to include at or near the start of its transmission than Wettenbosser, uh, weather forecast? And we use these cribs, uh, these best guesses, uh, to try and help us. So here's some ciphertext uh, that might have been generated uh, by an Enigma machine uh, on board such a weather ship. Let's put our crib, our best guess, uh, right up against it at the start. Uh, but do you remember what I said? Uh, the one quirk to the Enigma machine was that it could not self-encipher. So the way I've got it set here uh, cannot be because T cannot be enciphered as T. So let's move the ruler along one. Uh, any good? No? W cannot be W, and neither can uh, G be G. Uh, let's move it along one. Uh, any good? No? E cannot be E. So let's uh, move it along one. Uh, uh, any good? No, A cannot be A. Let's uh, move it along one. Uh, any good? Well, blank silence. Uh, there are no crashes, as they call it in wartime. There's nowhere where one letter is enciphered as itself. Uh, so that might be, and I stress might be, that might be uh, the correct setting. I say might be because this isn't the complete message, it doesn't have all the letters of the alphabet. There will be other places uh, where I could find uh, somewhere uh, where there are no crashes. But let's uh, leave it set to the one uh, that we had and turn our attention uh, to the bomb machine. So I've already mentioned uh, these drums uh, here. They call them uh, Letchworth. Uh, enigmas, uh, because the machine was manufactured at Letchworth, uh, and the, the trios here are arranged uh, vertically, uh, whereas in the Enigma machine uh, they are horizontal, uh, but no, no matter about that. So I could take this first Letchworth Enigma, and I could set it uh, to see if it can find a position where W will be enciphered as S. And I do that uh, with these 26-way uh, uh, cables, uh, pretty obviously 26-way because of the 26 letters uh, of the alphabet. Uh, I, I can input and output uh, uh, W to S, and I can set uh, this, this first letter with Enigma uh, to try and uh, 
Fine. That, and uh, if you look around the back of the machine, uh, you will see all these plugs in position. Uh, lots of them. Uh, you'll see uh, here in a minute just why um, you need uh, so many, which makes it look a bit like a jungle. Well, there are the 26 letters of the alphabet around this drum, 26 around this, 26 around this, 26 times 26 times 26, 17,576. And in a minute, uh, you'll see the uh, bomb machine work, and it can cycle through all those in about 15 minutes. And I could set, uh, as I say, that first letter with Enigma uh, to try and find uh, this particular pairing. And if it does, it will try and stop the machine. Uh, but actually, uh, it will probably find that pairing several hundred times in the course of that run. Uh, but that's no good on its own, because not only do we want W to be in ciphered as S, in the next position we want E to be in ciphered as N. So we could take the second letter with Enigma and see if it will find an E to N pairing. And we will take the output of the first letter with Enigma, put it into the input of the second, and so it isn't until both of those have found their pairings that the machine will stop. But just two is no good. Uh, we want T to M in the third position, so let's set the, uh, the next letter with Enigma to that, T to K in the fourth position, and so on and so on. And so it isn't until all 12 of these have found uh, their own particular partners that the machine will finally stop. So if we could set it going, please. to a halt. It's found uh, something that satisfies these uh, parameters, uh, but do you remember what I said? This only might be the correct setting, not necessarily certain. Uh, so what I need to do is to pay particular attention uh, to what's on these indicator drums, S, N and Y, which gives me uh, a relative indication of, of the start position. And then there's something perhaps I should have mentioned uh, earlier. Obviously there's a big motor uh, that drives all these drums round, uh, but I have to input uh, um, a signal somewhere into this first uh, letter with Enigma, uh, and I choose G as my input letter because G appears in the plain text and quite a lot in the uh, cipher text. And uh, Turing uh, designed the machine uh, so that um, in a little uh, indicator around the side, the, the wrench called it a letterbox, because it looks like a, a letterbox, uh, this fact a pointer that points to D, that is suggesting that my input, uh, G, would be paired to, uh, uh, to D uh, on the uh, plug board here. Well, I can take all, all those round to a, a checking machine around the back of the uh, bomb here. I won't say too much about this because you might like to have fun uh, trying to do this for, for yourself. Uh, but I can take all those uh, settings and I can check them out and see if there seems to be any inconsistencies, anything wrong. And having done this before, I happen to know that I will find something wrong. Uh, what I mean by find something wrong, well, very simply, uh, I mean uh, this. Uh, on the German Enigma machine with the plug board, you can only plug one plug into one socket. With the settings that I've got here, it will be suggesting to me that I need to plug more than one plug into a particular socket, and that obviously can't be, it makes that invalid. So what do I need to do? I need to start the machine again from where it stopped and see if it will give me a second uh, position.
Well, it has given me a second position that satisfies uh, these parameters. Uh, there are different uh, letters on the indicator drums, D, K, X. There's a different letter, possibly Q, in the uh, letterbox there that suggests that my input letter uh, G is paired with Q. Uh, and, and again, I can take these round to the checking machine. Uh, and again, having done this before, I happen to know that if I do try this out, I will find no, there isn't anything wrong. There don't seem to be any inconsistencies. It's not trying to tell me that I need to plug more than one plug in, into one socket. Uh, so things seem to be going pretty well. Uh, for, for that to be, I must have got the right three out of the five um, uh, drums corresponding to the three out of the five uh, rotors in the Enigma. I've got one of the plug pairings, G to Q. As I go around with the checking machine, I can find uh, most, if not all, of the uh, other uh, plug pairings. So things are looking uh, pretty, pretty good. What this uh, machine can't help me with is finding the, the ring settings uh, around each of those rotors. Uh, the right-hand ring setting is fairly easy to find. Um, uh, the other two can be a bit more tricky. Uh, but in wartime, anyway, by breakfast time, whatever time breakfast was uh, at Bletchley Park, they would hope to have all the settings just as though uh, they had captured uh, one of these sheets. And then they could take a captured Enigma machine or perhaps through the Polish clone, more likely uh, uh, one of our Type X machines that had been modified to, to act like a, uh, an Enigma and gave a printout on, on paper tape rather than just lamp lighting. But no matter which, um, put the right three out of the five drums in, uh, put the right ring settings in, put the right plug pairings in, and then if I type in some German ciphertext, it out comes uh, plain sensible German. Uh, I've cracked it. I've cracked it for the whole 24 hours. It doesn't translate it for you. You have to do something. <laughs> um, uh, as I say, uh, I've done that for the whole 24 hours. Uh, 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 but actually, uh, the Germans had over 50 uh, different networks working each day, uh, many of them with far more interesting intelligence than the weather forecast for the North Sea. Uh, uh, so uh, there was plenty more to do uh, for the rest of the day. And of course, come midnight, all the settings change and we're right back to, to square one. Well, of necessity, uh, how I've described it is a slightly simplified uh, explanation. If you want to stay and ask questions or, or have a closer look at the Enigma machine or, or use the, the checking machine at the back there, uh, you'd be very welcome uh, to do so. Uh, just finally, if I've lost some of you somewhere along the line, uh, could I leave you with one final thought? The bomb machine was not trying to find the right setting, it was discarding all the wrong settings, and rather like looking for a needle in a haystack. And the odds are probably worse than trying to find a needle in a haystack. We went diving in straight away and trying to find the needle, we were pulling out useless straws one at a time and leaving the needle behind. And that is quite a good analogy uh, to the way the bomb machine works. Well, thanks for listening to me, uh, thanks for coming to the park today, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your time here.